chronic neck pain and stiffness and, and pain really in all her joints. She had insomnia and she had some levels of fluctuating anxiety. And this could be almost any patient. I mean, if you look at this, this is, you know, this is probably the cl classic patient that walks into my office with chronic health care problems. But when we take a deeper look at what's going on with her, you start to see not only does she have these primary complaints, you see that she's got a, a number of secondary complaints as well. She's got tension and irritability and dizziness and poor balance and joint swelling. And she's got chronic TMJ and jaw issues. She's got pain and numbness in her hands. She's got depression and light sensitivity. She's had allergies and sinus problems and she has di diarrhea and constipation. She had menstrual cramps and she had reduced memory. So these are just, these are really the, the real important things to her. So she's got more than what's going on. So she's got quite a bit going on. She's got some significant health challenges. Her medication history, she's currently taking Synthroid, Crestor, Citalopram, which is an SSRI medication, Metformin and Excedrin. So this kind of gives us a little bit of the picture of what's going on. If we take a look at our timeline, we can kind of see where maybe some of these things, um, how some of her problems maybe evolved over time. As a child, she was born C-section. She wasn't breastfed. She had a number of childhood illnesses and took a bunch of antibiotics like many. She had a concussion when she was young. And she had constant swollen glands. She was always getting tested to see what was going on. And she had constant fatigue even as a child. In her teenage years, she started to develop headaches. And when she hit, when she started her menstrual cycle, she started having menstrual regularities, heavy bleeding, lots of cramps, and was put on birth control to, to control her bleeding. She had some digestive problems for which she was seeing on and off. And she really didn't remember how much treatment she had done, but she knows she had uh, plenty of antibiotics for different types of infections. When she was in her 20s, she had her gallbladder removed. In her 30s, she, was, she had pregnancy. She has two pregnancies. Uh, the first one was a, a, a C-section, not by choice. The second one was recommended. After her pregnancy, she was diagnosed with PCOS, and her doctor put her on metformin to control her PCOS. Um, later, in her, in her, later on in her 30s, she was diagnosed with depression and put on the SSRI medication. In her 40s, she was diagnosed with hypothyroidism and put on Synthroid. She was also diagnosed with high cholesterol, and that's when she was put on Crestor. She had a lot of stress going on uh, in her 40s as she went through a, kind of a nasty divorce. She was in a motor vehicle accident and had a pretty bad um, sprain strain whiplash injury. That's about the, the migraines got a bit, headaches got a little bit worse and turned more into migraines, and she started taking Excedrin and, and, and aspirin to try and deal with the migraines. She was diagnosed with arthritis or fibromyalgia. She said that she didn't think that anybody was really clear. They, she didn't think they really knew what was going on at that point, uh, but that was her diagnosis. And she was eventually, uh, at one point in her 40s, admitted to the hospital and spent 18 months on antibiotics for Lyme disease. In uh, her 50s, she was diagnosed with diverticulitis. And it was um, not long after that diverticulitis diverticulitis diagnosis that she wound up in my office. Well, Eric, when you, when you look at this, go back for a second on this yep. timeline, you, you see the classic situation here. You see just a perfect storm of development. So you got a C-section, oh, yeah. you're, you're lacking the vaginal birth and all the benefits from that. You're, you're, you're not getting the breast milk uh, nutrition. You're getting mountains of antibiotics at a young age. Then you get a head injury and you get swollen glands, who knows what happened there, and uh, constant fatigue, and then it's just a constant progression. And then for every quote unquote diagnosis or quote unquote disease state, you're given a pill. Yeah, so, and so, he, so here's the issue, Ben, is this is the timeline and you're giving the secrets away before we get there. <laughs> but that's a good thing, we're gonna, we're gonna cover this, we're gonna cover it, we're gonna go back and revisit this timeline. But yeah, you're exactly right. I wasn't going to cover that just yet. But the, yeah, it, when you look at this at the, at the outside, if you're a functional medicine practitioner, you're looking at this like Ben and I are, and you're saying, yeah, here's the perfect storm, right? Everything leads to the next thing. And you can kind of see it when you look at it in timeline fashion, like this whole thing just coming along. But if you're the, if you're a, if you're the, the patient or the person who's experiencing this, I don't know if we have any non-physicians or non-functional practitioners on the line. If you're the patient, you may look at this and just think it's a whole bunch of different 
problems, right? And don't see the, the tie-in of all this stuff. But I'm going to go through the steps, and then we'll come back and we'll visit that timeline unless you want to do that sooner. No, no, no. Keep going. Okay, great. So we did, uh, I, I have my patients fill out assessment forms. And so I took a show a little picture of here and they're just, they're like survey questions. And so we, I have them fill out three different forms. One's called a metabolic assessment form. She scored 152. Uh, in, this is one of those situations where you don't want the highest score. You want this as close to zero as possible. So she scored a 152 on the MAF, the brain function assessment form. She scored an 83. The brain health and nutrition assessment form, she scored 114. And so really what it do, these forms do is they look at different organ systems to see which things may be challenged. And from a functional medicine perspective um, or for, from a strategic medicine perspective, we, we know that all the systems are tied. But it's in, it, it, this kind of helps the patient see, wow, this is a, there's a, all these things. I have problems in all these areas. And it helps build this kind of web of dysfunction that's creating their issues. When we did her exam, she's 5'3", 161, BMI is 28.52. Blood pressure's okay. It's a little higher on the right. Significant thing is, though, when she goes from seated to standing, her blood pressure drops. So she's got some orthostatic hypotension, indicating that her adrenal system is probably not in great shape. Her O2 saturation is not great either. Her temperature in her upper extremity is actually pretty good from arm to hand. But when we look at the lower body temperature, the, from the leg to the foot, there's a pretty significant drop. I don't like to see a greater than four, four degree drop there. And so there's pretty good drop there. So she's not circulating blood flow real well. She had palpable abdominal tenderness throughout the whole bowel. She's got palpable joint tenderness at every single joint. And then when we did our orthopedic and neurologic testing, she had C6 and S1 disc and nerve compromise. She was seeing another chiropractor at the time, so I didn't handle any of the chiropractic stuff. We kind of dove into the metabolic stuff. So I asked her to bring in, because her doctor told her that there was, she was fine, there was nothing wrong with her, um, beyond the fact that he had her on the medication. So I said, well, bring in the blood panel. She said, well, he did a really good blood panel. So this is the extensive blood panel that was done. And uh, I guess if you look at this, yeah, it looks pretty good. There's not a lot going on here. There's not much tested. So what gets measured gets managed. So uh, my, my recommendation for her was to get, let's get a better blood panel done. So I ordered a better metabolic panel. We talked about some tests that we could do to figure out what's going on. We talked about organic acid testing and, and gut testing. And the, really the big things that she wanted to do when we talked about dietary considerations and things we might do is she didn't want to give up her favorite foods like gluten and dairy and those types of things. So we settled on doing a gluten intolerance test and a cross reactivity panel through Apex or through Cyrex labs as a starter test. And we ran a better blood panel. Now the blood panel, she took the, the blood panel recommendations from me and said, my doctor will definitely run this whole panel. Um, so that never happens, but I gave her the benefit of the doubt and let her do it. And I'll show you that panel in a second. We also started her on an anti-inflammatory diet, what I call an anti-inflammatory diet. For me, that's real food. Um, it's gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, and egg-free to get started. Um, and so we started with those things. We looked at her symptoms initially. We graded those out. So you can see she's got quite a bit going on. Migraines are 10. Memory loss is a 10. Light sensitivity is a 10 out of 10, 10 being bad. Sleep challenges, she had a hard time going to sleep and staying asleep. Irritability is about an eight, sinuses an eight, allergies an eight, diarrhea an eight, constipation an eight. Reduced smell and taste is a six, her anxiety is about a six, her depression is about a six. Pain and numbness in their hands about a six. So you can see these values. Um, and so we'll touch, we'll keep tracking these as we go. So here's the blood panel. This isn't really everything I ordered, but this is what her doctor decided of the blood work I ordered was appropriate and that he wanted to run. And so even from this though, a little bit more expansive panel, we can start to see there's some challenges here. Where the number one is you see the elevated BUN. So for me, we start, I start to get concerned about some renal insufficiency. I also think about is there a lot of ammonia being produced and she's just having a hard time clearing it. At number two, with the sodium potassium levels the way they are, I'm thinking there's maybe some adrenal challenges. 
Uh, with three, with globulin being high, I'm thinking there's potentially some hypochlorhydria issues. I also know that taking a look at RBCs and hemoglobin, maybe some, there's some dehydration. Number four, she's got an elevated white count. It's not out of the lab range, but it's elevated from my standards from the functional level. So I'm concerned about some type of immune or infectious process going on. And look at her triglycerides and lipids. This is a woman who's already on a statin. And so her values are really, really high. Now, I wanted a full thyroid panel, but so I could see what was going on with her thyroid. But of course, that wasn't necessary, only the TSH. So we kind of pointed these things out. Uh, well, what happened was she didn't, she was going, she wasn't ready to get started. We just did these tests. And so we got that test done. We got the Cyrex lab testing done. And for the most part, it really wasn't too bad, except for this. There's something called gluteomorphin and pro. Uh, prodynorphin, which were positive, out of range. And these are op gl gluteomorphin and prodynorphin, and gluteomorphin specifically is an opioid that's formed by the breakdown of gluten when it's digested. And these guys, if you have antibodies to these, these can really cause some nasty neurological issues. Um, and she really didn't like coming off gluten, and this is probably one of the reasons why. Uh, as far as cross-reactivity or other food sensitivities, she actually really look pretty good. I see a lot of times I see these a lot worse, but her, her values aren't too bad. So when she bops back into the office on 8-7, we go through all of all of those labs and we decide we're going to get started with some care. You can see her symptoms have changed a bit from where she was back in June. The only thing she's really done is done a somewhat anti-inflammatory diet. She didn't give everything up. She didn't, didn't do great with it, but she did a lot better than she was. And Overall, she had some change and improvement of her symptoms. So we start our metabolic program. We, we keep her on that anti-inflammatory diet. I do a GABA challenge, and I use a GABA challenge to just see if the, maybe the, there's compromise of the blood-brain barrier. GABA in the, in the form we're giving it to her really shouldn't cross the blood-brain barrier. But if there's a leaky blood-brain barrier and you give them GABA and they get really tired or sleepy or get overly agitated or it has some type of effect, usually it's an indication of potential blood-brain barrier compromise. We started her on some interphase to help with uh, biofilm break that down. We put her on some vitamin D to get started. We gave her a gluten flam, which is a proteolytic enzyme to help break down gluten and dairy proteins while she was trying to work her way off the gluten. And then we started our 4R protocol with some Repairvite and some GI, some antimicrobials, anti-yeast and, anti and some anti-parasitics and some probiotics. I really wanted to run uh, an organic acid and uh, GI testing on her, but she, 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 didn't, she wasn't going for it. But I did get her to run the uh, new metabolic panel. And so I'll show you what we see there. Interesting, it's, it's two months later. Hey, Eric, one and, second. One second. Yeah. Um, head back to that. So Last uh, slide. Yeah. So things were improving along here. Why do you think her anxiety increased? That's a good question. I think one of the reasons her anxiety may have increased, and we're going to touch base on this, is she's taking an SSRI medication. Okay. And you know, yeah. One of the, right. So we're going to we're going to touch base on that, but I'm going to go through these a little bit. But overall, there's some improvement of some things. But that is a good point right off the bat. And so I'll talk about it. There, it went up, and that's an interesting thing. You'd say, well, if you're if she's eating a little bit better and doing less, maybe problematic or inflammatory things, why the heck would her anxiety go up? And you're going to see why as we kind of go through the process. But that's a good catch, Ben. I was going to come back to it, but that's that's a good catch. Yeah, yeah. One other thing I was going to point out too is, you know, a lot of people, you know, myself and, and my family and, and many patients as well, and, and doctors who work with these people who are trying to get them off gluten or any food, there's a lot of anxiety around that, right? So when you, yep. when, you, when you tell somebody to change their lifestyle and what they eat, there is an inherent, oh my God, what am I going to do? So I thought maybe that could have contributed to it as well, but. Uh, and it might have, and yeah. it might have a bit, and I, and I think it did in the beginning because coming off gluten, when you have those gluteomorphin proteins, it's th those are, it really makes it a really addictive component and it's really harder to come off those people are a bit nastier and a bit meaner when they're coming off of the stuff but the other the key to that is what you see right underneath it and that's the depression and i think that's the real issue her depression went down mm -hmm. 
And so we're going to talk about how the, with the depression going down and being on that SSRI medication, it potentially drove the anxiety up. Okay. Okay. Great. So here's the blood panel now. Uh, so this is two months later. It's a little bit more thorough panel. I think you can see that. You can see there's some other issues going on here. Her calcium levels were elevated. Uh, I did check uh, parathyroid just to see if there was anything going on there, and there wasn't. But ferritin was elevated with low serum iron, so potential inflammatory component there. Look at her triglycerides. They're down at 169. Her cholesterol is 165. LDL is 86. She's still taking the same level of medication for statins. So there's, that raises two questions for me. Is there a more sinister issue going on or did she did, did just cleaning up her diet really seem to help her? So she was starting to feel better, so I'm not overly concerned about anything sinister, but it's a pretty impressive drop over a two month period of time. You look at TSH, it's still normal. T4, T3 is still normal, free T4 is normal, and T3 is normal. But what wasn't run was reverse T3 before. And if you can see, reverse T3 is out of range. And it's pretty high. So what does that mean? That means the Synthroid that she was getting, that T4 that she was getting, wasn't really helping her metabolism. Because it really wasn't getting into the cells. Most of it was probably being converted into reverse T3 instead of getting converted into T3 and actually getting into the cells. And this is one of the things we're going to talk about. I'm going to speak on it at, at the at ShyCon is the cellular hypothyroid pattern. If we look at free T3 to reverse T3 ratio, which is one of those things that I do, this value is like uh, 0.12. And I, what the research says and what I like to see is that that value to be 0.2 or greater of T, T, free T3 to reverse T3. So part of her issue is that she's got cellular hypothyroidism going on. She's getting an overconversion of the synthroid from T to T4 to T to reverse T3, which is blocking her receptors, really isn't doing what it should be doing. The other factor is, is she's got Hashimoto's. She's got autoimmune attack, and she's got a pretty significant case. She, her fibrinogen levels are elevated, so it's another inflammatory marker. Her vitamin D is low, and her homocysteine is elevated, so potential methylation issues, potential issues with glutathione production. Um, her CRP is high. So there, this lady, when you do a little bit more thorough panel, you can start to see that she really has some significant health issues going on here. So 30 days goes by. We, we've been working on that 4R protocol and the anti-inflammatory diet support, and now you take a look at where she's at 30 days after we started the metabolic support. And her migraines are down to zero. Her memory's a little bit improved, but light sensitivity has improved. Her fatigue levels have improved. Her sleep challenges have improved. Her irritability is better. Her sinuses are better. Everything, everything is significantly better, which is awesome. She's lost about 14 pounds, and she's really doing pretty good. We talked about doing the one test that really didn't excite her. I was hot and heavy on doing methylation panels at that time, and I really wanted to see what was going on, so we got a methylation panel done. We decided we were going to continue with some another 30 days of GI support and continue on that for our program. Eric, so at the, uh, yeah, Eric I have one question uh, uh, yep. from Terry. She goes, how do you know she has Hashimoto's from these labs? So. Uh, if you can oh, just, I'm sorry. yeah, it's fine. Just, just jump back. It's, it's, uh, you know, there's the sure. TSH is not elevated, but you know, like you said, there is a functional hypothyroidism plus you've got the thyroid globulin antibody. So basically it's just that she has a functional hypothyroidism, right? Due to elevated RT3 and a antibody against thyroid globulin, I would imagine. Yeah. So she's got, high, well, oh, she's TPO got TPO too. Yeah, there she's it is. Got TPO, she's got TPO and thyroid globulin antibody. The antibodies associated with Hashimoto's. Right. Her TSH is not high now. It was once, right? So she had an elevated TSH at one point that her doctor diagnosed her as hypothyroid. So with having the high TSH at one point and having the antibodies, she got Hashimoto's. Mm -hmm. what I now they would call it. They would say that it's controlled. Somebody might say that's a controlled thyroid condition because TSH and T4 are within normal range. But we got to remember that TSH is really a, a evaluating what's happening at the pituitary gland, not at, the, not at all the rest of the cells in the body necessarily. So 
TSH is really reflective of the pituitary T3 levels. And the pituitary gland works a bit different with transport molecules and, um, and deiodinase enzymes than a lot of the other cells in the body. So just because TSH and T4 is normal doesn't mean that the cellular system or that they don't have cellular hypothyroidism, which is really what this person has. You can call it functional. I call it cellular because that's really what's happening is they're not getting thyroid hormone into the cells and having it work appropriately. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. And I'm going to cover that a bit more at Shikon. So we're going to do a whole case on that. Excellent. Or I'm going to try and get it all in. So now we're at the 60 day point. And here's the interesting thing. So she has increased anxiousness, reduced ability to sleep, and increased irritability. So you can see her sleep challenges up, irritability is up, her anxiety levels up, her depression's down to zero. We've completed the 4R program. We've added some adrenal support, which initially helped the fatigue and sleep, but now all of a sudden, the sleep has gotten worse and she's more irritable and she's wondering what the heck is going on and so am I. And so you, initially I started to question, okay, what's going on here? We decided to start with some liver and detox and biliary support for about 30 days and we used some products to do that. And I was thinking, all right, you know, maybe it's a detoxification thing and maybe that's it. I don't have any genetics at this point. Um, and I kind of was, you know, you look at the medication she's at, but, you know, I initially I'm thinking, mm, what's, what else is going on? We tried a couple of, of things to try and support sleep. We tried GABA. We tried some other support products um, to see if we could regulate sleep. And none of those things really worked. Um, the methylation camp panel came back in in between the 60 day and when the 90 day follow up. And so let's just take a look at that methylation panel real quick and see what issues are going on there. You, when you do a methylation panel through HDRI labs, this on the left here, this is what you get back. For me, that's visually hard to look at. And so I had to make this little chart uh, for me. And now I think I'd fill it in a little bit more with more things in there, but I did this probably three years ago. Um, I was so proud of myself, right, Ben? Because I sent this to you and say, look what I did, right? That's awesome. So, right? So as a visual learner, what I wanted to see is what's going on. And if you look at the methylation panel, you can see homocysteine levels are elevated. You see that our 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate is it's, it's within the normal range. That, that range I'm not totally certain about, but it's at the lower end of that. Her SAMe levels are, low, are, are a bit low, so her methylation is going to be compromised. And we have to ask the question, why is that compromised to begin with? Is she not eating protein? Well, I know she's eating protein. We've given her some digestive enzymes to help, but we know she's got, I'm, I'm assuming she's got some gut issues and maybe that's compromising MAT, potentially has some SNPs, but I'm looking at poor energy production. I'm thinking about leaky gut syndrome, lipopolysaccharides, bacterial overgrowth is all things kind of inhibiting MAT. We've got elevated saw and it's not, overly elevated, but we know saw elevations will actually inhibit methylation enzymes or methylation reactions, and that can create some issues as well. We see elevations of adenosine, and adenosine is, uh, and a high homocysteine will push that reaction back towards and, and create more saw buildup. And when I look at adenosine, I also think about not just this reaction coming through, but adenosine could go to help mitochondrial function. But if mitochondria are sick and not very healthy, then the challenge, the ability, the, the process of potentially building up adenosine uh, can really start to push that reaction back. The other interesting thing is that she's got elevated adenosine, but her uric acid levels aren't elevated. You would think that that pathway would be cleared, but she probably has some blocks in that pathway as well. She's got her glutathione pathway and transsulfuration pathway. We just really have down here the down to glutathione. And you can see her reduced glutathione, which is the major antioxidant in the body, is a bit lower than it should be. And her oxidized glutathione is a bit higher than she, it should be. So she's having a poor time recycling her glutathione. And oxidized glutathione is, is not a friend of yours. You really need to have this recycled to do stuff good. Only the reduced glutathione is really the beneficial form. We look at her folate levels, and her, uh, her folate levels are lower than they should be, so she's also not getting good B9 into the cell, so that's pretty low. So the good news is of seeing this is that we've already started to support this process, 
but she's definitely got some problems in the metabolic pathways or in the methylation pathways. So here we are at 90 days. She's come back. We've done 30 days of liver and bile and glutathione support and methylation support. And interestingly, we take a look at her symptoms and her migraines have jumped up to a 10 again. And so it's a head scratcher and you say, man, what is going on here? Well, it just so happens that she's uh, decided she's, uh, she wanted to eat some gluten. <laughs> and so what she found out is that, hey, when I eat that stuff, I don't feel good. And so that was the big jump here. Interestingly, uh, a couple of things got a little bit worse, but her sleep challenges got better and her irritability got better, and her anxiety got better. And so I'm thinking, yeah, it was a methylation problem. I fixed it. And so that was it. But when I talked to her, I said, we talked about the sleep support I gave, and she said, nope, that, none of those things had helped. Um, and we had seen her a couple times in between here. She said, the biggest thing that made the change is I went off my SSRI. And that was a pretty cool thing. And at that point, uh, Ben didn't have the updated, you weren't, we weren't on version four. <laughs> so those pathway planners weren't where they were. And so we didn't have some of those things on there, but we had, I had to dig in and do a little bit of research on it. And he started to find out that, hey, this taking the SSRI may, may have been part of the problem uh, with why she had the anxiety. It may have, because serotonin, when it pulls, or you have elevations of serotonin, can inhibit or compromise the comp reactions because it, it, it kind of inhibits SAMe binding. So it can really slow down her clearance of catecholamines, especially epinephrine. And that may have been what was driving the anxiety. So anyway, she's doing really pretty good, except for the gluten exposure. She's actually doing pretty good. So we order a new metabolic panel and some interesting things come up. We took a look at our hemoglobin A1C and it's up. And now I'm scratching my head again. I'm thinking, what is going on? How could she be more insulin resistant now than she was before? And I'll tell you why in a second. Her iron levels are still low, but her ferrin levels have dropped, which to me tells me that part of that inflammatory process is getting better. But look at her triglyceride levels now. They've jumped up. Her cholesterol levels are back up. Her LDL levels are back up and her VLDL is back up. And I'm thinking, what is going on with this lady? It can't, what is going on? We take a look at her TSH level, and it's worse too. And I could, you know, when I first looked at it, I was like, man, maybe it's, maybe the Hashimoto's is really kicked in. But now you come down and you look at her reverse T3, and look what's going on. Her reverse T3 dropped from 24.6 to 12.4. That's pretty great. That means she's getting more, she's having less of that thyroid hormone converted into reverse T3. Her vitamin D levels are a little bit better, so the sublingual vitamin D is helping out. Her homocysteine levels have improved, and her CRP's going up. So I, she comes in for her, net, for her next appointment after we do this, and I say to her, what is going on? She's, overall, her symptoms are doing better. She's feeling really pretty good. She's had a little bit more gluten exposure, which creates a little bit more of the irritability. But the biggest thing she says to me is she felt so good going off the SSRI medication that she quit all the rest of her medications. Mm. So when she quit all the other medications, they were just masking some of those things. So that's why these things look a bit worse. So interestingly, the values went up. We still have some more work to do, but that it explains some of these things. So a little, a little point there is make sure you understand what your patient's on and off. And when they go off things, it's probably a good idea that they tell you um, instead of surprise you. Because uh, I had a whole different reg regime ready until I found that out. But overall, she's doing really pretty good. You take a look at her symptoms, her migraines are up, headaches are a little bit. And she wouldn't even call these migraines anymore. She calls these more headaches. Um, the fatigue levels are doing pr pretty good and she's really doing pretty good. She's holding pretty steady at about 154 pounds. Her symptoms are pretty good. It was Thanksgiving and she was eating gluten and now it's going to be Christmas. And she says, you know what, doc, I just, I feel great compared to where I was. I feel great. I want to take a break and I want to enjoy the holidays and I'll come back and see you when, when the holidays are over. And she does. So it's about five months later. Holidays are over. She's done glutenizing herself. Uh, she's still off of her medications. 
Um, her hemoglobin A1C is, has improved again. Her triglyceride levels are still high. Cholesterol is still high. LDL is still high. So she's still got some issues here. Her TSH levels have improved. Her vitamin D continues to improve. Her homocysteine's up a little bit, but her CRP has improved as well. So the good news is that overall she's improving. There's still some issues going on with these lipids, and we want to get into those. Into those. But unfortunately, um, she has an injury and winds up needing surgery and therapy. And it was, and I didn't wind up seeing her after that. Um, cause she was, she was held up with the injuries she had. So, but this is a lady who had all of these health issues and really had some pretty significant improvement as we went through the process. And so what the heck was going on with her? Why did her, and then we Ben kind of for me, but here's the thing, right? What happened to her? Why did her sleep and her anxiety get worse in, in October? And I think the, and and why did it get better when she went off her SSRI medication? They're great questions. So we're going to talk about it. If you don't have these planners that Ben has, has done, these things are awesome. It really helps you understand kind of the chemistry of what's going on. But we want to take, we want to kind of circle around what this enzyme called MAO. MAO can be upregulated it's a, by inflammation, and I'll show you some research on that. So inflammatory chemicals can upregulate MAO. And when you upregulate MAO, you go through serotonin a ton faster. You increase hydrogen peroxide production, which can then has to chew up some glutathione. But if you go through serotonin a lot faster, what are you going to develop? You're going to probably develop depression. As you speed up this MAO enzyme, you're also going through FAD a lot quicker. And what's going to happen with, with uh, fat metabolism? It's going to be compromised. And all of these things can potentially have some compromise on what's happening with COMT down the line. So we want to see what's going on here. And MAO is really important for dopamine clearance as well. But the really important thing I think for her was uh, all the inflammatory stuff that was going on with her was really depleting her serotonin, which led to her depression. And that depression then led to her need for an SSRI. So here's a study from 2015. This one's fairly new. And essentially what this says is that inflammation upregulates the expression of MAO 2,000 fold. Oh, this is from 2004. I'm sorry. But 2,000 fold. That's pretty intense. If that increases MAO 2,000 fold, you're going to really go through serotonin pretty quickly. So that can leave us with a state of depression possibly. The next study, this, this one is from, I think this one's 2014 or 2015, but essentially what this says is that inflammatory, um, Stress, inflammatory pathways, reactive oxygen species, and stress are all known to increase MAO activity. And so if we're increasing MAO activity, we can, our patients can have de depression. Here's another one. Essentially what this says is that MAO, the RS6323, if, they're, if they have a normal variant on the report, they have the, the fastest functioning enzyme. And so if that's a fa fast functioning enzyme and you add inflammatory mix to it, man, that can really speed up that enzyme. Can serot what is serotonin? This I'm going to talk about this. This is I think I mixed up this slide here in the order of these things. But what's the impact of if you take an SSRI medication and you pull serotonin or you slow the clearance of serotonin? Well, serotonin can actually inhibit COP activity. It actually inhibits the SAM reaction. So if we slow COMT then we're going to hold on to epinephrine longer. And there's our recipe to build up anxiousness, anxiety. If we now go back and take a look at our timeline, now you can see some of the, we'll talk about how maybe all this stuff developed. She was born C-section. Why is vaginal delivery so important? Because that's like the first, not one of the first areas of inoculation of the child to, to get the appropriate inoculation of the, for the gut flora. Breastfeeding, really important to support healthy gut flora. 
childhood illnesses. She grew up in an era where for every illness, there was an antibiotic. And so what does that do to gut flora? It really compromises gut flora. Concussion, when, you, when the brain's concussed, we inflame the brain. The, the immune cells of the gut and the brain are tied. And so if you inflame the gut, you inflame the, if you inflame the brain, you inflame the gut. And she had chronic swollen glands. I, I wonder why. She had chronic immune and inflammatory issues as early as childhood. I'm sure this was driving headaches. She had menstrual irregularities. Is there any tie between her menstrual irregularities and maybe what was going on with her gut? Sure there is. You've got bacterial overgrowth that can produce beta-glucuronidases that can inhibit the uh, detoxification of estrogens. And if that happens, what happens to estrogens? They recycle back into the system and you wind up with estrogen dominance, menstrual cramps, menstrual irregularities. Her digestive problems continue. So there's GI issues just continue to get worse. We talk about potentially DAO compromise and histamine intolerance, and that could be what was driving her migraines. Diagnosed with PCOS, well, it's no wonder. She had her gallbladder is removed. Does that have a tie into any of this? Of course it does. And especially with estrogen, what happens when you have too much estrogen or estrogen dominance? It makes the bile thick like, uh, like molasses or a Wendy's uh, frosty. It's hard to get it out. And if the gallbladder becomes, if the bile becomes thick, you don't absorb fats. Is there a potential problem downstream for chronic pain syndromes? You bet. Because if you, if you can't absorb fats because you don't have bile or healthy bile physiology, even if you're eating a healthy diet with leafy greens, those leafy greens have calcium and oxalates that are in there. The calcium can disassociate from the oxalates that bind to the fats and go out in the poo. And the oxalates can get into the system and create lots of pain syndromes and other neurologic issues. So definitely a tie in there. Gallbladder physiology and proper bile physiology is really important to keep the small bowel healthy and sterile and keep the stuff from the colon and coming up. In her 30s, two pregnancies, two C-sections, and depression. What's one of the things that happens, especially right after pregnancy, is there can be a quick drop in estrogen, and that can drive depression. That, with all the inflammatory things, all driving on that MAO enzyme, is there a potential that she has would get depression? Yeah, she's got, this is the recipe. This is the perfect storm for depression. And so she starts taking the SSRI medication. And when she, did it work? Of course it did. It helped pull the serotonin. She felt better. She admitted that. At least in the short run, she felt better. She started in her 40s, she's got hypothyroidism, probably because the gut issues drove the autoimmune process. The research seems to show that the thyroid gland is one of the is probably the most sensitive organ to autoimmunity. She's got high cholesterol. Well, I wouldn't find that hard to believe. All the stressors going on, MVA, car accident, and with everything else going on, is there any reason why she might have chronic pain syndrome going on? Yeah, lots of reasons. And if she's taking the SSRI and it's inhibiting the clearance of epinephrine, which is driving up her anxiousness and anxiety, it's also going to drive pain syndromes. She's diagnosed with Lyme. She didn't have any testing to, to show that she had actual Lyme disease. That was just the diagnosis that was given to her. And whether she had it or not, 18 months of antibiotics didn't do her GI tract any good. And it would, I wouldn't find it as a surprise that she had diverticulitis following that. So is there reasons for this poor woman to have the problems she did? Yeah, this is like the perfect storm. And this is why it's so important to take a good chronologic history to see where, how this whole process develops. So when we go back, I, pay, I had her do a 23andMe and I didn't get the, she sent me the information and I didn't get her back in the office because of her injury to go through this. But I highlighted the homozygous defects she has. Look what she has a homozygous defect in, COMT. So she's already got an enzyme that doesn't work super efficiently. She's got SAMe problems. She's not making enough SAMe. She's got too much SAW. That's going to inhibit it. She's got estrogen issues that are going to slow this enzyme as well. 
She's got serotonin pooling from taking her SSRI medication that's kind of compromised this as well. And so this whole process gets slowed down and drives more in anxiety. So what happened to her when she had that episode where she everything got worse? Well, the issue that probably occurred was as we started to reduce her inflammatory load, as we started to drop it and improve her physiology, her inflammation went down. She was pulling her own serotonin. She wasn't clearing it as fast as she was before. So between making more of her own serotonin, not clearing it as fast, and the SSRI medication, she was driving up the her epinephrine levels and her catecholamine levels, which was driving her anxiety. So by her saying, hey, none of these sleep things you're doing are helping me, and stopping the SSRI medication, this enzyme, at least we took another break off this enzyme. The methylation support we did, we gave her helped as well. And this whole process probably worked a ton better. And that's probably the scenario for what happened. So key insights to this, inflammation can increase MAO activity. Increased MAO depletes serotonin, which is gonna create the depression. When people have depression, they go to their docs and their docs prescribe SRI, SSRIs, pull the serotonin. And that can help in the short run. But if it's there for an extended period of time, it can inhibit Compton. If there's other things going on, and there always is, there can be other things that compromise Compt as well. Slowed Comp can, can slow the clearance of catecholamines, and that can drive up anxiety. If the patient has SNPs, and we talk about this all the time, Benton, and it's one of my pet peeves, I know it's one of Ben's, we don't treat SNPs. SNP, SNPs are somebody's tendency, not their destiny. And so just because she has comp, that doesn't mean she's going to have it. In this situation, she got better even though she had a homozygous defect. But it was all the other factors that were inhibiting it along with her SNP that really pushed the, pushed the envelope. And so one of the key things I think is important, it, whether you're the patient or the physician, is you got to look big picture. It's one of the, it's one of the things that we really want to work on at, at Shy and, and is having everybody look at that big picture. It's why Dr. Lynch developed all these planners so you could see the chemistry laid out in front of you. You don't have to memorize it. You can use these planners and load things on here to say, hey, Here's where the patient has a, home, a defect. Here's the, here's the things that I have deficiencies in. Here's the inhibitors. Here's the promoters. Man, that's why this patient may have some issues. And when you look at it from a, from a pathway planner perspective, you can really start to see some of the issues. She had high homocysteine levels. Well, if you take a look, she had MTHFR677 homozygous defect. Is that going to impact full, her, her getting a sufficient level of folate? Yeah, you bet. She's got MTR and MTRR, so is her recycling of homocysteine going to be pretty good? Probably not. BHMT, a heterozygous defect, but she had, I'm sure she had high cortisol, which she, we didn't get an opportunity to do that, but that could be some of the things that were driving or slowing the recycling of homocysteine and preventing the, elevate, the appropriate levels of SAW and, and SAM. And there, could, there is a whole bunch of other cool things in this, but the big things I wanted to point out in this in this case study was what happened between the inflammation driving the MAO enzyme, increasing that, that um, clearance of serotonin, driving the depression, her, her doctor doing what made sense, which was, hey, she's depressed, seems like she has low serotonin levels, let's give her some, an SSRI. And it helped, and it helped initially, but eventually it create, started probably to create, with all the other things going on, create the anxiousness. And then definitely when we started reducing that inflammatory load, that's probably what jacked up her anxiety at that point. So I think I, think I got through it. How's that for time? Good man. Good man. All right. Yeah. Well done and great key insights there too. So we got a couple questions here, and uh, before I get to some of these questions, I just want to say quickly that ShyCon 2016, as you can see here, is coming up very quickly, and Eric will be there, I'll be there, along with 14 to 15 other health professionals uh, presenting, among hundreds of others attending, and we're really looking forward to presenting 
key areas which are affecting all these pathways because a lot of people are SNP focused, including health professionals. And so it's, I believe we really need to understand what is affecting these cycles beyond just SNPs. And as you can see here, some of these key topics, these key topics of moles, vaccinations, metals, GI issues, and so on are definitely affecting these cycles. So it is important that we educate the health professionals about what's going on here and also the general public. And I also want to announce, you guys are the first to hear it, is that we are live streaming ShyCon 2016. I don't know if Eric knows that, but since we are live streaming ShyCon 2016, uh, if you have not received an email on that, um, you can email events at seekinghealth.org here because the live streaming to the general public is ridiculously uh, affordable. It's $95. So that's three and a half days of lecture content and you tune in at the regular hours and it's $95. And our point here for making it so affordable is because we want to help you get the education that you need and to help you understand what is going on with you at least a little bit. You're not going to understand everything. I'm going to say that right now because this is a health professional conference. But if you understand anything that Dr. Balkovich told you here and shared with you, then you are going to gain some key insights that you can share with your health professional and help direct your care because it is up to you ultimately to improve your health. The doctors and health professionals are just guides. So you need to find the right guide, but you also need to fight the right, find the right information. And we're here to help you do that. So you can email events at seekinghealth.org to learn more about the live streaming if you can't attend ShyCon. If you are a health professional, we highly encourage you because the community is awesome. And uh, you know, what would you say about the community that's been growing, Eric? Yeah, I, I think with the beauty of the conference and why it's why you want to be there is the communication between the the people. We're you know we're it's amazing. The last conference there was the there was great things that happened during the conference, but there was so much information that was shared in between the in between the in between the conference the um, the presentations. That I mean, there's so many jewels and that are shared in clinical pearls that, and you communicate and build your network of people that you get to meet. It was awesome. I would say if you're debating whether to live stream or be at the conference, I would say do what it takes to get to the conference because it is the live stream is great, but when you're there, you're immersed in it. You're part of the community. You can see that there's other people just like you who are, that have challenges that are looking for help that can help you. I, I I spent probably every minute in between conferences sharing information, meeting people. I mean, it was a, it's a great and growing community and the more people there, the better. Exactly. Exactly. And so this is going to be a yearly event every April. So we're looking forward to it. So information's here and while you guys look at that, I want to answer some questions here. Uh, and a question from Sally. Uh, there's a patient compromise with DAO, MAO-A, MAO-B, HNMT, COM-T, those are all homozygous, major depression and anxiety, where do you start? You, do you want me to answer that one? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, you start, you start with the basics, right? And so don't start with SNPs, okay? The place to start is, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're working with your patients, the place to start is definitely with a good metabolic panel, in my opinion, maybe an organic acid, amino acid panel, maybe a stool panel, but you've got to look at the gut. The gut is really the window to challenges. You've got to make sure you have healthy gut physiology. You want to take a look at micronutrient deficiencies and make sure they're absorbing things. You want to make sure that you take a look at blood sugar regulation. So I think you start with an anti-inflammatory or autoimmune diet. You take a look at the gut. You try and regulate blood sugar through diet, nutrition, but you start you start with basics. Do not, don't jump to the SNPs because it, if you just l try and load the body with a bunch of micronutrients that you think are going to support the SNPs, not only may you not help them, but you could potentially make them worse. And if you've got microorganisms in the gut that are already stealing those micronutrients, just overloading the system is not necessarily going to make that any better. You've got to get to the root cause of things and their genetics aren't typically the root cause. If they've had the problem since birth and they're real severe, then yeah, maybe that's the primary cause. 
but most of our patients that we see, these are patients who got progressively worse over time, and that is not a primary gene issue. The genes play a role, they're a tendency, but they're not the primary. Deal with the basic issues first. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, the, the genes are, are helpful as an additional tool, just like your stethoscope and, and other tools, but, you know, it's definitely not where you start. And so when you, when, you, when you ask questions like this, you know, I highly encourage just to do the basic SOAP format. You know, you, you, you present the case like you normally would to a colleague, and then you add SNPs in, in the part of the assessment area. So in that way, uh, you understand the, the sex and the age of the patient, what's going on, the diagnoses, the meds that they're on and all that. Um, and when you do all that, you can start seeing a pattern because when, like Eric did here, when you show the entire timeline, that's very useful. So what I would do, you know, do the fundamentals and the basics like Eric said, but I would definitely draw out the timeline and make the timeline with the patient. And you should have every single one of your patients fill out a timeline. And as Shy, what we're trying to do is we're, tr we're creating uh, templates for you guys to start using these things. We'll be working on that during the summer. And uh, so eventually we'll have a lot of tools for you guys. So you can just put your own clinical information on there and, and plug and play and be quick. So that's, that's a great point. And what I, what I am seeing in these SNPs is there are a susceptibility for sure for elevated histamine. It uh, doesn't mean that they are there because just like Eric said, they're a tendency. Uh, they're not absolute, but the tendency for Dow and Mao and HNMT and COMT, uh, you've got a very significant potential for, for uh, uh, histamine elevation. Now, what you did not mention is the specific RSIDs. Uh, you know, there are some uh, genetic polymorphisms in all of our genes that don't play any role at all. They don't speed them up. They don't slow them down. And the epigenetic control too is far superior uh, for most of the time for these genes to control. But um, RSIDs are very important because some RSIDs um, are very uh, more significant than others. So I would also try a, a lower histamine diet uh, along with the anti-inflammatory diet. It is tough uh, for the patient, but doing these things helps. Uh, there's a great program out there for, for b both general public and the health professional. It's called Food Pharmacy. Uh, Eric, did you get that? Yeah, I have it. Yep. Yeah. Do you like it? Yeah, it's helpful. I, it, it really, it, it's a helpful tool. So yeah, I would go to it and, and get it. It's another tool for the toolbox. I will add one other thing. Um, two things. One, that the question you asked is a great question for the forum. So if you're if, if you're not on the forum and you're asking that question. Join the forum, put that type of question in the forum, but as Ben said, put all the, put the history, what's their primary complaints, secondary complaints, put that in there. We'll work on the forum to make it easy to load all that information onto the forum so you can put it on there. Because if you put that stuff on there as a physician, then Dr. Armin and I can help you under, to tell you what's the best things, but just telling us SNPs doesn't help. We need to know more of the patient history. We want to tell us, show us what blood work, what lab work. So we'll work with, we'll work to get a good format so it's easier to plug and play that in there. And then we're more than happy as, as a physician um, to help assist you in some of those things if you put that type of information into the forum. But that's what the forum's about. Right. The other thing is, if they've got some issues potentially with histamine and gut issues. Ben, Seeking Health makes a great product to support that. So you can go to seekinghealth.com and get the and get the histoblock and and uh, and that stuff has been a has been a godsend for my patients. Great, thanks. And uh, I'm trying to find those questions, I just lost them. Hold on, here they are. Um, so, uh, one second here. Sorry, y'all. I got distracted with answering this one person's question. Um, let's see. It's a great question. Where to go? In hindsight, I love hindsight questions. Um, in hindsight, considering her test results and her ups and downs, would you have changed anything in the order you did uh, things or your focus? Yeah, in hindsight, I would have liked to have potentially looked at. Uh, 
maybe gone back and taken a look at um, gut physio. I really would have liked to have done more testing and seen what was going on in there. Um, I probably would have uh, probably if I if I was more aware, I probably would have addressed that first. But you know what? I I, I probably would have looked at at hormone physiology and maybe tried to support that a little bit sooner. But um, gosh, every, almost every case when I, I, every time you do a case and you get down to the, you get to the end, you look at it and you go, man, now that I've gone through that process, maybe I would have done this or that. But overall, um, I probably would have liked to have done a little bit better testing to maybe be a little bit more specific. Um, and addressing estrogen levels may, and adrenals maybe a little bit sooner. Um, but at the end of the day, so far it's played out well. Um, and maybe hit the blood sugar a little bit harder to regulate that a little bit better. But, um, you know, again, we're at the mercy of the patient sometimes too. Um, and what they do and what they choose to do. And alcohol and gluten and all those things started to come back in. But um, overall, I think, the, I think the case went pretty well. Yeah, I would say so. She did pretty well, and the compliance is, is always tough, I mean, for anyone, including ourselves. Um, let's see, do you agree? Ah, this is, uh, yeah. Um, so, do you agree that methionine and SAMI increase histone methylation and folates decrease histone methylation? Do you want to answer that, or do you want me to? I didn't get it all, so go ahead. So do you agree that methionine and SAMe increase histone methylation and folates decrease histone methylation? Adrian, I, I, these, these types of questions, I understand where you're going because we all want black and white, uh, but it's not that easy. Um, you know, SAMe, when you swallow a pill or you swallow folate or, or B12, you know, you, you can't direct it what it's going to do. I mean, you swallow folate, how do you not know it's not going to go towards making uh, SAMe? I mean, you can't you can't tell folate to do DNA repair. If you swallow folate, it can become methylfolate and make SAMe. Um, if you take methionine, um, you know that gets broken down and and uh, other things. So, you know, not to evade your question, uh, I know where this is coming from, I believe, but uh, what. Eric and I and, and most of the presenters at, at SHI, at Seeking Health Educational Institute, what we try to do is we try to really emphasize a big picture thinking rather than minutiae statements like this. Because at the end of the day, does it really matter, um, you know, about specific targeting of a specific pathway? It's not possible. I mean, there's so many pathways that we don't even understand in the body that we can't get bogged down in focusing on them. So. Um, do I agree about this? No, I actually don't. I, I actually vehemently disagree. And I vehemently disagree because uh, nobody knows. And if you look at research uh, on this, all they're doing is looking at, at research that's mostly done in vitro, meaning in a Petri dish or a test tube, rather than, than uh, you know, human live cells. And even if you do a human live cell, it's a cell rather than the entire body with everything communicating. So I, I don't think we can be that specific. So with that said, what, what would you think, Eric? Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, we, we do things, but we, can, we, can't, we, we can't target as much as we think we can um, or we'd like to think we can. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm more along the lines with you than with that statement. Okay. All right, good. And, you know, I, I really don't mean to be disrespectful and, and not answer you. I just really believe that that is the answer um, because we don't know everything. And if I if I did go and answer that and say, yeah, I do do agree with that, that would be a disservice because one, I'd be BSing you. And, uh, you know, two, I don't think anybody really knows. Um, and so does does Eric Balkavage work with patients by Skype? Eric? Yes. I have patients from all over, and we deal with quite a few of them by Skype. Okay, and how would you recommend going about that? Uh, I think the best thing to do is to contact my office. Um, I can give you, a, I'll, I can give my office phone number, and they can reach my office and get a hold of us. Okay, and what's that number? 
610 558 8920. Okay, so 610 558 8920. That's correct. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, what about the elevated thyroglobulin antibodies and the possibility of thyroid cancer underlying this lab abnormality? And that ultrasound might be helpful in this regard. Do you agree? Uh, oh, I agree. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I think it's worth evaluating. It's not, um, she is, she's been sent back to her primary care. The, what I didn't show on there is that thyroid antibodies have come down. That doesn't necessarily mean there isn't possibility, but I think it's still something that should be done. Um, but she needs to, that has to be, as a, as a chiropractor, I usually would refer that back to their endocrinologist to have that look to have that done. Okay, great. Good point. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yep. So uh, a point here by, by Mark. Uh, he said there's a great new book out there by Kelly Brogan. She's an MD practicing functional medicine. She wrote a book called A Mind of Your Own. Uh, I know Kelly and, and uh, her book is, uh, you know, bringing up a, a very important point that uh, SSRIs and the whole serotonin thing is a, is a big pharmaceutical issue. Um, and she talks about ways to utilize your own, uh, you know, basically utilizing nutrition and lifestyle things that Eric was mentioning earlier today too. So, um, so if you're interested in, in getting a book and curling up and reading about stuff like this, uh, Dr. Kelly Brogan's book on Amazon, a mind of your own, I have not yet read it. Um, uh, I'm not sure exactly what she is saying entirely, but I do agree with her stance that mainstream medicine and pharma they do tend to uh, glorify things and, and produce research that says, hey, this drug will work for this problem. And as a result, SSRIs can be very useful for um, you know, depression and things like that. But in reality, they're not. Um, but I, what I will say is I, I firmly believe that serotonin is associated with depression. And I do think if someone has low serotonin, uh, one, they're not going to sleep very well. And two, uh, they're going to be uh, you know, not quite pleased and not happy. And they're going to be gravitating more towards carbohydrates and, and binging on carbs. And, uh, so I'm not sure if she speaks about that serotonin is not related at all to depression or if she's just saying that SSRIs are not the preferred treatment. So I just want to say that, um, because when I recommend things, I also like to make sure I put my own thoughts in there too. So, I mean, Eric, you were just pointing out too, that, um, you know, the SSRI helped your patient here. And, uh, you know, she had inflammation and her serotonin levels are dropping and we didn't even touch the chiurinin pathway. So, I mean, what's right. your, yeah, I mean, you would also agree with me yeah, that serotonin is seen in those with depression. Uh, I, I see, I see, I see it all the time. And so, you know, is there, does, does the SSRI work for, listen, there's patients that come in and say, I took it and it worked, whether it's placebo or not, it's working for them. The problem is it doesn't address the underlying issue, right? <laughs> so the, the underlying issue is what's depleting the serotonin, if that's really what's going on, what's, what's depleting the serotonin to begin with? And that's really what we wanted to do is get to root cause. And, you know, the pharmaceutical companies make medications to make money. That's what they do. So I, you can't really blame them. But it's, it, if we're trying to get somebody better, you, we're not going to drug them healthy. <laughs> okay, right we could, we're, in the u.s we're what five percent of the world's population and we consume depending on what you read anywhere from 45 to 70 percent of the world's pharmaceuticals if we could drug ourselves healthy we should be we would be the best at it but it doesn't it doesn't work it's a good acute care model for some people but it's not the way to make yourself healthy you cannot drug yourself to health You've got to do it through diet, lifestyle, the, the methylated life factors we talk about, the things we really focused on at the last SHI conference, exercise, physical activity, good mindset, sleep, good nutrition. All of those things are really important first. Diet, lifestyle created our, our health problems. Diet and lifestyle can help fix our, our, our issues. We just have to give them the opportunity. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we're running a bit over and I want to respect Eric's time. 
Um, so let's see, last question here. Um, so I'll just quickly say here, uh, David Elliott says, Your Doctor is Wrong is another great book. So Your Doctor is Wrong. Um, that's uh, great if they're not talking about Eric Rye, right? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, let's see. And he also chimes in here. What do you mean we don't have drug deficiencies? Um, yeah, I mean, we all have. Uh, actually, America, I don't think we have too many drug deficiencies. I think we're doing pretty good on that. Um, drug, drug deficiencies? I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> no, no, he's just messing with us. Um, so could you go over the insulin resistance that got worse again? Yeah, well, remember she dropped, she was taking metformin. And so she was, her doctor gave her metformin for her PCOS. So she stopped taking the metformin and that was prob that and the combination of in inter introducing the gluten and uh, alcohol back into her diet probably were and some other things over the holidays are probably some of the things that drove up her insulin resistance. Um, it, I didn't go into this, but I did look at her genetics and there are some, uh, she does have some compromises in cholesterol and LDL pathways. Um, I didn't get that's too much for this talk, but there were some challenges there. And those are things I would have gone over with her had we uh, had another chance to, to continue the process. Okay, great. All right. Um, and uh, that's it. So I just want to say thank you, Eric, for your time. And thank you all for attending. Uh, you know, I'm glad that you're here because otherwise, uh, you know, what we're trying to do doesn't get out there. And, and the health professionals who attended, thank you very much for taking an evening out and an afternoon out to, to try to improve your knowledge so you can work with your patients and sharing your insight with us as well. So again, if you want to obtain these recordings, you can go to seekinghealth.org and opt in for a membership there under the products tab. And then you'll get access to all these videos here, which Eric is showing you. Plus you get a discount at ShyCon um, and uh, you get access to all the webinars that are in the database as well. And there's quite a number. Oh, and then it's annoying ringtone on the phone. Um, so anyway, thank you very much. And hopefully I'll be seeing many of you guys at ShyCon and gals either in person or via live streaming. Thanks again, Eric. Yep, thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. everybody.